Greetings and welcome back to yet another discussion on dialects and sociolects, and in this case as well, the politics of dialect. It is a continuation of the previous talk, so it would behoove all of us to have viewed the previous video. And I do apologize for the rather abrupt omission of material that I had incorporated in the previous video. I have attempted to ascertain what the cause of this loss was to no avail. It shall, in all likelihood, remain one of the great mysteries of the universe, and thus we must content ourselves with this loss and persevere, lest we lose ourselves to a world of hopes dashed and dreams forgotten. But moving on, I did want to continue with that talk and talk about some new elements. Now, one thing I did not mention in the previous video were the essential criteria, the scientific or linguistic, if you will, criteria for the state of being a dialect. What makes a dialect distinct from a language? Now, this is actually a politically loaded question. I'll be talking about this further into the video, but for now, let's stick with the scientific basis. Generally speaking, the consensus as to whether or not something is a dialect or a language is based uh, upon mutual intelligibility, meaning how much of the two or three or however many languages can be understood amongst themselves. That is to say, a, a language uh, that has several dialects where you know, there is, say, 90% mutual intelligibility, these are dialects of that language. Say, language X has variation, you know, X1, X2, and X3. And between all these three variations of the, of the standard, there is 80 to 100% mutual intelligibility, <clears throat> and it doesn't prevent uh, people from under getting their points across for the most part. Well, that would be uh, a dialect. Right. Very different is the scenario where you begin to lose intelligibility, and no one to date, to my uh, knowledge, has ever offered specific percentages and how much is mutually intelligible or not. But if if a language is sufficiently unintelligible, despite having common genetic origins, it's going to be classified as a different language. Uh, so a classic example of this was Old Norse and Old English. They're both Germanic languages, but in the case of Old North, Norse, it is it was an, an North Germanic language, and in English, it was and is a West Germanic language. And thus, despite having a lot of vocabulary in common, and even some grammatical features in common, what you had at the end of the day were too many differences in the minute de details of grammar. For example, uh, Old Norse, as all modern Northern Germanic languages, has what we call enclitic definite articles. Now, that sounds fancy. All that means is that the definite article is post-positioned. It is put on the end of a noun as opposed to the beginning. So in the case of Old English, that wasn't um, what we saw. Old English, as in modern English, only has the definite article preceding the noun. So the example I would show here would be, you know, the horse. Uh, that horse uh, in Old English versus the Old Norse word for horse, which was hester, hesterin with the definite article, which you can see at the end, that in is, means the, so hesterin, the horse. It also happens to be masculine, the Old English word was, was neuter, so even more confusion. So there was, back in the day, over a thousand years ago, when the Danish inv invaded uh, the north of England, you know, some degree of mutual intelligibility, but it wasn't enough to get the job done, and thus Old Norse was in fact a separate language from Old English, if only because of some significantly deviant grammatical features uh, between the two. But that is the technical definition of, of dialect. That is, you know, what's the difference between a dialect and a full-fledged language? Well, that's the linguistic classification, but it's actually a pretty, pretty politically... Uh, charged issue, uh, and politics, unfortunately, for better or worse, does, and history and economics and all that good stuff, these all play a role in determining, at least to the lay and the lay people of the world, what a diet, what constitutes a dialect and, and what does not. I mean, one very common example of this is China, which is still technically a communist country ruled by uh, 
autocrats for the most part. And in order to ensure this power structure, they used the term Chinese language. Now, Chinese language is an overarching term that encompasses just a hoary host of, of different dialects and indeed uh, distinct uh, languages. A Mandarin, for example, encompasses several different dialects. It is a, the official language of China, but these other languages that are classified as dialects, such as in the South, there's Wu, um, and for example, uh, Cantonese is, uh, to my knowledge, technically uh, classified as, as a Yu dialect, and it's, it's got a mass of speakers. There's Yu, there's Hakka, there's Min, there's Yang, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, Gan, etc. And, and, and these languages uh, are in fact separate languages. I mean, Cantonese uh, is genetically related to Mandarin, just like Dutch is genetically related to English, but uh, English speakers with no training in Dutch don't understand Dutch, and likewise, Cantonese speakers with no training in Cantonese don't understand Cantonese. So they're Oh, in Mandarin. So there, there are separate languages, in fact. They are separate languages. They're distinct from each other. But for the purposes of political expediency and attempts to politically control the landscape, Cantonese is referred to as a dialect of, of Chinese, and Chinese is in fact, in air quotes, in fact, Mandarin. But this is manifestly not the case. Uh, there are at least five, maybe six, even seven different regions of uh, of Chinese variation uh, that you have genetically related languages. Uh, they're all they all belong to the Sinitic or the the Chinese branch of languages, but they are distinct in the same sense that Dutch is distinct from from English, German is distinct from English, even though these are all West Germanic languages. There are other uh, examples of this that really don't have the whole sort of power struggle behind it. I mean, if you look at a country such as Sweden and Norway, Swedish and Norwegian are very intelligible, perhaps not entirely, but I would argue they're probably 80% mutually intelligible. And yet you have this one language called Swedish and one called Norwegian. Why aren't they dialects of each other? Well, political circumstance, the way things worked out, uh, there was a, that's just the way it is. Uh, but a Swedish person can converse with a person in Norwegian and vice versa and understand each other for the most part uh, without all too much confusion. And, uh, and a very recent example, at least comparatively speaking, is the case uh, of former Yugoslavia. Now, we have this word these days, the balkanization process, you know, which describes sort of the splitting up of, of uh, units of a country into individual nation states. And this, after the war in the 90s, had an effect on, on the Balkan Peninsula with respect to Serbo-Croatian. Now, uh, as many of you might know, Serbo-Croatian, uh, though I do not speak it, I'm well aware that there really is no difference in, the, in terms of the grammar and, and most of the vocabulary between Croatian and Serbian. And so you essentially have you know, four successor states that speak the same language, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, uh, Serbia, and Montenegro, they all speak essentially the same language, but you know, within the borders, they're referred to separate, uh, something separate. So you know, Serbian is quote-unquote different from Croatian. And no doubt I've heard there are some minor differences, but people can speak to each other with no problems and understand you know, 99% of what they're saying. So why the, these are, are quote unquote different languages, but they're really just dialects of the same language. But the war, uh, the conflict, and political circumstance eventually led to the creation of separate uh, successor states, and the successor states uh, decided to incorporate a different policy of appellation, if you will. Uh, these are languages, not dialects. And so we can see that politics does, in fact, uh, play a rather large role in the creation of of perception of what is a language and what is a dialect. However, going back to the basics and the technical definition, mutual intelligibility is the primary criterion of what is a dialect versus what is a language. And a few questions were posed uh, concerning, say, Romance languages, so I'll address those. Uh, I do speak one Romance language competently, and I'm, f I'm at least familiar with all the others. Uh, so in the case of Romance, Romance languages are effectively modern Latin. 
right? As many of you know, the Roman Empire encompassed, uh, which to that up in that point in time, the the largest uh, swath of of land territory that had ever been seen in the ancient world. No, no, not Alexander. No one had conquered that amount of territory and put down its footprint. Now, not all of these places le- uh, had a Latin footprint left in them, uh, at least a direct one. But several countries that we know as modern-day Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, and Romania, as well as parts of Switzerland, did in fact have this footprint left in them, and they they do speak modern Latin. But, of course, 2,000 years ago, they were simply dialects of Latin. There was uh, you know, Gallic Latin spoken in France. There was uh, Hispanic Latin spoken in Spain. There was Italian Latin spoken in, uh, in Italy. And, of course, Dacian, standing for Dacia, where modern-day Romania, where you know, they spoke their own version of Latin. But I think it's, although we don't have exact dates on this, exact dates, we do have approximate dates, that up until the early Middle Ages, they were more or less still mutually intelligible. Around 500 AD, though, uh, or BCE as they, uh, sorry, CE as they use these days, the common era, you see the beginnings of what are what what's might be called proto-romance, <clears throat> and indeed distinct attributes of these languages. And the further time goes by, the further we move along the timeline, we see uh, a greater splitting diversification of the Latin dialects into you know, fully-fledged Romance languages, all with distinct features, uh, some of them very similar to each other, some very dissimilar to each other, and so on. And this took hundreds of years. I mean, hundreds of years. Some languages went really their own way. French is probably, of all the Romance languages, the one most foreign to Latin in terms of its pronunciation, and certainly in terms of its uh, its vocabulary, for example, French has the largest component of Germanic vocabulary of any Romance language. Uh, and the pronunciation is just, in air quotes, weird compared to most Romance languages. Uh, some languages are remarkably similar in many respects. Italian has retained much of the vocabulary. And in fact, some of the grammar is quite similar. And in the case of Romanian, which was an outlier and isolated from basically all the other Romance communities, you got what essentially was a retention of many features that were not preserved in in Latin. So you have many archaic grammatical features in Romanian that you don't find in any of the ma- other major Romance languages. These include uh, the preservation of, of a neuter. Now, most Romance languages you're familiar with, they have a masculine and a feminine, but Latin, like German and many other languages, such as Russian, had a neuter, you know, neither a feminine nor a masculine, and Romanian, at least to some extent, has retained this. To my understanding, Romanian retains this in the sense that this neuter is the takes on the masculine form in the singular and the feminine form in the plural. Uh, but nonetheless, the neuter does not, is not a classification that really exists in other Romance languages. It also retains what we might call a, a, a case system. It's not very robust. But, you know, it has you know, nominatives, accusatives, uh, datives, genitives, for those of you familiar with the terms. I've talked about them in previous videos, if you're not. And it has a very interesting feature, similar to North Germanic, where you have a definite article that is post-positioned it is, and in enclitic it's put at the end, as opposed to the indefinite article, which is put at the beginning. And this shows that Romanian show, shares features with other languages in the area, such as Bulgarian and Macedonian. And it is nonetheless a Romance language, and it develops in isolation. So one thing we can definitely see is uh, the, the further away a language is from the action, as it were, the greater the isolation, the more archaic it tends to be and remain. And in addition to that, the more distinct features it develops. And one example of this is, I mean, Icelandic is essentially still Old Norse, more or less modern-day Icelandic. And it, it is remarkably archaic in terms of its grammar, not necessarily its pronunciation, but the grammar is, 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 is almost identical to Old Norse. Some very minor distinctions, and I mean, we're talking a thousand years have gone by, not much has changed. So languages do change. Uh, but the greater the isolation, the less the change uh, tends to be. Uh, 
And certainly in continental Europe, the Romance languages took you know, hundreds of years to completely dissimilate into something that we would call Romance, Proto-Romance, and then fully-fledged Romance languages. But more to the point, I've talked about this many times, modern-day means of communication, media, etc., these tend to cement, uh, media in general tend to cement uh, languages together, generally speaking. And I think we could argue with high degrees of certainty that, or clo to degrees of, of virtual certainty, that had there never been a media or technological revolution, that the deviation, the distinctions between uh, languages such as you know, North American English, specifically American English, British English, Australian English, <clears throat> would be far, far greater than they are now. Because we have the evidence from the past, and we, we know even Spain and France being only separated by a hundred, a few hundred kilometers, really, uh, developed into very distinct uh, variants of, of the Latin language. I mean, they're both modern Latin, but they are distinct languages from each other in many regards. So modern media tends to cement, uh, tend to cement these things together. They tend to act as a, a shield, if you will, against uh, change. But then again, it's a complicated issue because you have politics involved and what have you. However, in the most technical sense, yes, a dialect is something that is still mutually intelligible with the standard of the language. And when it is no longer intelligible, it becomes a different language, a separate language. And uh, dialects all have that potential, but given the, the stronghold, the foothold of modern media and, and modern communication, in particular internet, that seems very unlikely. Now, I did talk about, moving on to a separate issue, uh, sociolex and the distinction. Sociolex being primarily based on ethnicity, uh, social status, economic status, dialect being almost entirely geographical. But we see a disintegration of, of some of this as well. Uh, language and the way one spoke used to be intimately tied to one's socioeconomic stratum. And... These days, the internet, I think, above all, has been the great game changer. There are people out there making who are multi-millionaires who, technically speaking, were born into lower uh, socioeconomic uh, strata that grew up acquiring language, uh, languages of, or versions of sociolects that are appropriate to that stratum and really are doing exceptionally well. That is to say... Back in the day, not even that far back, uh, maybe 30 years ago, certainly 40 years ago, before the internet, before mass tele telecommunication, we, your level of education, uh, your access to wealth, uh, your access to education, all these things, they played a role. And more often than not, it affected the way you spoke. In fact, this is a dying trend, but in the UK at least, there used to be uh, you know, a relatively robust business in uh, trying to train people to get rid of their both their dialects and their sociolectical features in their language so as to you know, speak much more of an RP version. Now, RP is received pronunciation as the so-called Queen's English. Almost nobody speaks this way. If you want to see or listen to how that sounds, you might want to listen to some old interviews of uh, J.R. Tolkien or maybe some BBC broadcast from the 1950s and 1960s. But nobody these days speaks with an RP accent from the 1950s. It is all but gone from the people of Britain, and it is a great tragedy, I think, uh, that nobody speaks this way anymore. Uh, received pronunciation used to be the gold standard that you've heard, you might hear from the uh, BBC broadcasting network or in television, and certainly the Queen and the royalty oh, spoke this way as well. But these days, almost nobody speaks this way, and is regarded as something rather silly and even ridiculous compared to normal means of speaking. So, uh, therewith I shall henceforth no longer speak this way. That is a really, that, that's essentially RP from back in the day. Nobody speaks that way anymore. Uh, there are more reasonable forms of received pronunciation, but but that used to be associated with you know the upper crust of society in Britain, for example. All of this 
uh, hoity-toity, if you will, hoity-toitiness uh, to be heard there. Uh, that was, you know, that was wealth, that was education, etc. The internet has been the great game changer, right? Uh, there are people such as KSI, who is basically a, uh, I'm, from my understanding, you can see a photo of him here, a, a guy from the inner city of London, lower socioeconomic uh, status originally, uh, and thus bound to a, a socio-elect, who was a multimillionaire. And how did he get to be a multimillionaire? Well, well an hour rapper apparently as well. Uh, well, he played FIFA in front of the television and people wa- in front of the internet. People watched him, found him amusing, and you know, he pulls off antics and you know, no education required. Uh, so, the internet might be the great leveler. I, I, certainly, you can still hear uh, differences, sociological differences, but the sociological differences. That is to say, look, let's go back to the, I've mentioned this many times, the classic Lebov study of New York City, that is roti- uh, roticity in, in, in English in New York City versus non-roticity. The people who say mother versus mother uh, or uh, taiki versus turkey and things like that. Uh, this these days is, is becoming less and less a, a marker of, of you know, how much money you might have now. It might describe where you came from originally, but the likelihood that it actually tells you where you are right now as an adult is becoming, uh, well, the window is becoming smaller and smaller. That is the peering window. It's, it's hard to really guess these days. I mean, if you were to hear just say KSI speak, you certainly wouldn't think he is uh, you know, a wealthy individual based simply on his sociolect. But you know, the world is changing. And Coltane, High Lord Coltane, did mention these cashed-up bogans in Western Australia involved in high-paying, uh, low-skill jobs, and that's, of course, an anomaly. But I think the Internet less and less is an anomaly so much a, a major feature. There are tons of people out on the Internet who make videos, are doing exceptionally well, but would be hardly regarded as you know the, the upper crust of, of education, articulation, and what have you. So I think, in general, the trend we see is uh, a lessening emphasis, uh, or rather a lesser emphasis, on on the way one speaks uh, to project oneself, one's ability to articulate oneself is becoming less important to much baser forms of, sort of entertainment. Look at PewDiePie, KSI. Uh, n- none of these people are would be regarded in, as belonging to some sort of educational uh, elite and consequently, of course, uh, access to wealth. No, they acquired the wealth in a very, very different way. So the world is changing, and I think in the next few decades we're going to see even uh, greater change and maybe even a different classification for these things. No doubt sociolects will remain, but sociolectical features might become something, and this is me just speculating, of a, of a universal feature uh, almost due to the Internet. Uh, certainly in, in written internet speak, very few English speakers distinguish between, for example, it's, that is the contracted verbal form, it is, and it's possessive pronoun, uh, there, 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 your, uh, never mind the difference between there is and there are. Uh, these things in, in common internet speak are, are just non-existent. So there might be a sociolectical uh feature arising from this that will unite most English speakers across the globe, not just in the UK or the United States. Anyway, I'm going to wrap it up there. I hope uh, that was informative and I hope the continuation helped to elucidate some points uh, that I might not have covered in the previous video or were unintentionally omitted due to that very abrupt uh, disruption. I am not averse to covering this topic and related topics in the future. This is as, as any any branch of human knowledge, a vast a vast field that can be plowed almost inexhaustibly. And uh, although I know far more about these the subject matter than the common person, I'm certainly not I'm, I'm not a PhD in this field. I'm not an expert. But still, there there are there are still things to be uh, to be grasped and learned from uh, this uh, area of inquiry. So anyway, there are will be, of course, more language-related videos in the future, probably not on dialect and so like, but you know, referring to other things. So we shall see. But as always, thanks for watching. And the usual disclaimer is...
Is it a disclaimer? No, it's more of a, a guiding force of the universe that Zeus be with you and that you show and pay Zeus proper respect. As always, thanks for watching and you enjoy your week.